You're listening to the Unsung Podcast, where we talk about classic albums and decide if they deserve that distinction. And we also talk about some unsung classics in the hopes of bringing them to a new audience. And at the end of it all, we let you decide if we are right or wrong. This is the Unsung Podcast. Listening to the Unsung Podcast, and this is episode number 32. On last week's episode, we were talking about Marnie Stern by Marnie Stern, and the public have decided that that record does indeed make it into our discography, so thank you to everybody who voted. On this episode, we are talking about Chosen Lord by AFX. Uh, you're listening to the Unsung Podcast. I am your host, Mark Fraser, and I'm joined by two men who have also survived the nuclear apocalypse that came upon us after last week's meeting between Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump. No, mate, it's fine, man. Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin are pure pals now, man. There will not be any nuclear war. Everything's good. Thank fuck it wasn't Hillary, man. We'd be dead by now. Do you like lobsters, Chris? <laughs> not as much as Jordan Peterson. I also don't like goats as much as Dave. But he likes black metal. I do love goats. You've you got, know, you've you know got the a things goat you're... skull in your house. Uh, actually, it's not a goat skull. Is it a sheep? It's a, I think it's a deer skull. A deer skull. But it was found. It was it was found by a laird, and <laughs> <laughs> uh, having died naturally, and he 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 bleaches them and gives them to people. So that, it's, that's it's, cool. It's, it's vegan. It to you. Yeah, it's 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 carrion. It's vegan and safe. Unlike you, your black metal and all your fucking goats and sacrifices and church burnings. Yeah, I sacrifice them. I don't eat Think them. about all the church mice that you've burned to death. That is true. <laughs> In pursuit of a cool cover. I know. <laughs> so many casualties. So uh, the man to my left, barely paying attention because he's embroiled still in some online fiasco. It's been a whole with week. The all right. <laughs> he's been a on there week. seven days, day and night, barely slept. <laughs> we had to chloroform him at one point to make him go to bed. <laughs> It's David Weaver. He's not even changed. He's still wearing that polka dot t-shirt. From a week ago. Mm. Fuck. And uh, to my right is Chris Cusa. Chris, I've just read an article <laughs> that um, Glasgow Bar introduces birthday parties for dogs. This will be possum. What does that sound? It's uh, Brewdog. Are you a big fan of Brewdog, Chris? Brewdog. I hear they're completely on the level. <laughs> <laughs> I hear they're... They are punks. <laughs> How cool is that? Yeah, they they did a they did this thing where you could pay twenty five million pounds and become a punk. Yeah, it's incredible. Something like that. I'm a punk. I've never paid twenty five million pounds though, so I'm not getting it wrong. Have you ever been involved in the stock market? There is nothing more punk <laughs> than trading shares. It's so cool. So yeah, to my right is uh, Glasgow's biggest stockbroker, Chris Cusack. Um. I fucking used a fountain pen to draw an anarchy symbol on my BMW. <laughs> I hate improvising. <laughs> <laughs> so are we going to do some fucking shit about music this week, guys? Yeah. So are we just going to talk about yeah, there's fucking probably, bigots there's, again? There's Hang probably enough to talk about. Yeah, there, but there's something I was going to talk about, and it's the alt-right. What's been going on this week? Oh, fuck <laughs> off. No, we're not talking about that. Were any of us right in our predictions? I, no, this week we're going to talk about Aphex Twin. So it's Aphex, it's not Apex. What? It's Aphex. Is that you right? say Aphex? You've been serious. How old are you? <laughs> you honestly think it's Apex Twin? No, I, I There's an people, H in there. I've heard, say, I've heard people say Apex Twin, and I was like, I can't You hang about PH. with the wrong people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clearly. But I've, I have heard it said. But so. he, I mean, this record that we're going to do is, all, is also under the AFX alias. So AFX is because it's Apex, not APX, not Apex.
on a related note, the minute I told people that we were doing Chosen Lords, yes, by AFX, yes, they said, oh, "Well, that's not an AFX twin album." And then I was like, "Shit!" So I need to really investigate this to see if that's going to just be an ineligibility factor. So AFX. Why are we only allowed to put forward albums by AFX twin? <laughs> No, well, to no. Be... The point is, if we're about to talk about Aphex Twin albums, but AFX is a distinct, separate project, well, then it wouldn't be fair to actually. Well, so say we put this in, yeah, uh-huh. and then we couldn't put in uh, Richard D. James' album. Well, also I was going to say, like, I was doing some research, and he 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 just sees the name as being the name of another thing he's done. It's all the same thing to him. Mm-hmm. Richard D. James's music is all Richard D. James's music, in his opinion. So what that means? Well, f- first of all. He the first thing he ever released was as AFX. Mm-hmm. It was a single, right? And then he became AFX twin. So the first release was called "In Trance to Exit." That was AFX, and then but then when he did the Analord series, which this is a compilation of, not an album, he released number ten first as AFX Twin, mm-hmm. and then retrospectively it was the rest were all released as AFX, and therefore number ten was sort of retrospectively uh, grouped under AFX as well. My point is, it just means that the the odds of this being successful are exponentially less if it's up against the catalogue of AFX Twin than if it's just up against the work of AFX because AFX has only really done the Analord series and that one weird little record thing and something recently. I'm quite happy for it to be up against... I think it should just be classed as Richard D. James' okay. record. I think he like, I think the, the key thing I learned when I was doing the research this week is that he just likes fucking with people. So the fact that we've just had this conversation means that he's pro- if he was listening he'd be laughing. I, I mean, I don't yeah, think we'd be don't laughing. Think I don't think we've been particularly funny yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you saying that we should should go back and do a, a Songs of Higher record because the one we did was actually the first Magnolia Electric Company? Well, we or should we do... We were, at pains, mag- we were at pains to kind of try and establish Yeah, but I don't that. think it matters because I think we did the one record of his of Jason Molina. Yeah, no, and that's, that, that's, that, counts, that so. is a fair analogy, but what I'm saying is I think that makes it highly unlikely that this is going to be in the, the discography because it's not the best album. But is Unsung <laughs> podcast about the best album, or is yeah. it about <laughs> an album that deserves to be talked about? Well, here or other ones. Here we are on episode. Uh, uh, just finally <laughs> getting to the crux of the matter. Hang on, here we are on episode thirty-two. <laughs> <laughs> yep, someone's keeping track. Um, I, no, it's not about the best albums. It's about the albums that deser- are the most underrated. That's what it's about. Exactly. Whether that is within the catalogue of a bigger artist or whether that is a, an artist that's overall underrated and this is the best album by that underrated artist. This uh, is undoubtedly going to be in amongst his less well-rated records, but I do think, or rather more underrated records, but I do think that when it comes to the public opinion, sometimes that doesn't seem to necessarily <laughs> penetrate and they'll just be like, why is this one going in? That's fine, well, let's see how it goes. Also, it's a compilation it's the greatest hits of one particular project. It's not an album. It is a record. It's an album that he said should run as it is. He, yeah. uh, he talks didn't, about it. He didn't want to release it, though. He wanted to release only in vinyl, and then they said, no, you have to put something out for CD. So he pulled tracks from across the 1 to 11 Analord series and compiled them for Chosen Lords. But he also said that this was his track listing in his brain when he was making a, an album. Oh, I'm I'm just doing my due diligence because we have some fastidious listeners. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, the minute I mentioned this, I immediately met with outrage and hostility from people who were like, "That's not a fixed twin. That's completely distinct." Turns out they were wrong, which I'm pretty happy about. <laughs> but I'm just getting out there ahead of it. This is definitely going to be raised at some point by some poster somewhere. That right. said, David, why this album? Well, should we talk about a fixed twin first? Please do enlighten yeah. us. Yeah, let's let's start there. So I mean, a lot of people will know a lot about Aphex Twin. A lot of people might just know little bits about him. He was certainly 
a huge name in the 90s, I think. Um, Can I just say in IDM or intelligent dance music <laughs> as opposed to stupid dance well, music? Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love that term, to it's be honest. fucking weird. I love how <laughs> stupid it is. <laughs> uh, but IDM was basically created to describe, you know, music like Aphex Twin and Otechra and Square Pusher and stuff like that. Stuff that wasn't just four to the floor club tracks it was electronic music but it it wasn't there necessarily to dance to it was much more complicated than that it's there to think about it was there to think <laughs> about and i'm not going to go into the mythology and i mean we could spend days talking about we can, we can skim past it because it's certainly amongst the most interesting things about the guy yeah there's a lot of stuff that's really interesting and fun about him Radio 4 actually did a little uh, um, oh, half-hour programme on, on the mythology. Mm-hmm. You watched it on the radio. <laughs> I watched that on my computer. I just stared at the <laughs> little bar as it moved along. <laughs> <laughs> you can't you can't say I'm wrong. Uh, no, that's fair. Uh, I love the, your life. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would take that over being on Facebook, arguing with people that are like pro-Trumpers any day of the week. Yeah, that is true. So yeah, I I remember first hearing of Aphex Twin in sort of the late nineties when I would have been you know twelve or thirteen, and I think seeing Come to Daddy video, mm-hmm. and then uh, Window Liquor as well, which were sort of like as close as he ever got to the mainstream, and he was sort of you know certainly with those videos they were very shocking, and I think even you know Chris tablet Cunningham. Yeah, Chris we, Cunningham we mentioned him in relation to the Bjork thing mm-hmm. as well, yeah. and I think he became some sort of even in the tabloids, he was like something that was, uh, I don't know, a sign of being out there and weird. I mean, 95 to 2000 was his commercial peak, according to basically everybody. Yeah. That, that was the point where he did his most breakthrough stuff. And it's interesting, though, because for a lot of people, Come to Daddy is their introduction to AFX Twin. <laughs> Reading him talking about it, Come to Daddy was a bad joke. He was trying to kind of satirise black metal and death metal yep. and do this ridiculous OTT monster noise thing that just sort of blew up. People heard it and they were like, that's dead cool. It actually works. And then he put it out <laughs> and then it became like horribly <laughs> for him, it became the thing he was known for. And he'd, he'd done all this great ambient music and all this really interesting yeah. electronica before it. Suddenly he was this, this pastiche that he'd done was becoming, was, was, Eclipsing the rest of it. Fortunately, it, it was then superseded by Window Liquor. Which, Which is actually a fucking amazing. A grip of music, track. yeah, a much more conventionally him, but eerie and sexual and weird and and the video is perfect as well because it's it creepy as fuck yeah superimposing his face on the dancers mm. and, like and yeah no it is it's really interesting how he sort of he began trying to remain anonymous and then as he got more famous throughout the 90s and people reacted to him more he started using ha- his face yeah well by his third album he had his face just on the cover and yeah by exactly. his fourth album, but it was always it was him. always a uh, you know distorted image of him and used unsettlingly yeah you know it was never you know him sitting with a mug of coffee going hey this is my record guys it's like if you're going to think of me then think of me as a popular format weird for, freak. for acid house and this and then late 90s was just the, the dj in the front with a, <laughs> a mug of coffee well actually i mean him and uh mike prenas from music music uh-huh. who yeah, created yeah. planet moo they did a little uh record together and it's got the two of them playing connect four on it it's really nice and wholesome oh, yeah, image yeah, i've actually seen that yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, good I record think- the fact that he sort of tried to remain anonymous at least behind the gruesome version of Aphex Twin the, the, the horrible smile, the distorted smile the, the face from Window Licker, the face from Come to Daddy um, he, he then it became its own 
sort of satire. When you went to his concerts recently, he had this software in place where the camera would pan across the crowd and project the footage onto the back of the stage. But the faces of the audience, your own face, would be replaced by Aphex Twin's face using the state-of-the-art mm-hmm. technology. And it is deeply, deeply <laughs> unsettling, like, like horrible to see because you're dancing about and waving and it's somebody else's, and it's somebody face. else's face. But then he always, he always had that sort of, like a story that I heard in that documentary was back in the 90s and a guy was at a festival watching Aphex Twin and this was like a music journalist who knew him and he was watching Aphex Twin up there on the... <laughs> I've heard this. Yeah. Thing, yeah. Uh, up there on the decks and then and a it was, guy... It was strobing and stuff. Lots of strobing yeah, yeah. and smoke and stuff but you know, you're still like, oh, that's Richard D. James and then at that same time what was undoubtedly Richard D. James walked in front of him laughing and through the crowd. And the the music journalist to this day still doesn't know whether it was Richard D. James up there and a lookalike, and does he just employ lookalikes to yeah. freak people out in the crowd? <laughs> or had he just employed somebody up on the stage and he was just walking around taking a piss? And it, like, who knows? And that's like, just he just fucks with people. Yeah, I mean, he did a set at Field Day, I think it was last year down in London. It mm-hmm. was just so brutal and full on. And, you know, the strobes were just incessant. He could have pretty much gone back to Cornwall. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just had a, had a mug of coffee, played Connect Four. <laughs> exactly. I actually, I saw Aphex Twin at Rock Ness. I'm amazed that he did that. That's, that's a story. 2000 and, I can't remember what it was, 2009-ish. You know but that that can't that can't have been far off the year we played it. That's, yeah, that's crazy. But it was it was back in the day when Rock Ness. This used to be a festival run at the top of Loch Ness, and it started the first year. It was uh, basically a big Fat Boy Slim gig, and the view was incredible because it's right at the tip of the Glen of the Great Glen, and you can see right down Loch Ness. Uh, and they were all, they were always lucky with the weather as well. And then the second year they got Daft Punk. Um and they c- sort of expanded into bands as well. I think yeah, but Biffy Clyro played it the year we were there. So did, yeah, uh, Flaming Lips. But and eventually th- they sold the festival to a major, uh, you know, festival company, and they kind of ruined it. And they ended up getting fucking Kasabian and and Example and all that. But in the beginning, it sure had a see. real legitimacy for electronic music because they had you know folk from the Sub Club and from the Arches coming up. Yeah, and from Optimo. Yeah. And it was really respected. And I, I saw the Prodigy there. I saw the Chemical Brothers there. I saw Aphex Twin there. I saw DJ Shadow there. In, an, in a field outside Inverness, which yeah. is just fucking ridiculous. Some of the best acts of all time in electronic music. And I saw Aphex Twin in this tent at like 5 p.m. He was quite high up on the list, but, you know, he wasn't a headliner. And I went into the tent and it was maybe half full at best. Uh, and... He did a two-hour set, and for one hour, it was like weird ambient stuff, not much beat at all, and like you know you're just sort of looking around and stroking your chin and going, yeah, I can see how this used to be good or <laughs> how this is very influential, you know, and you're like, am I enjoying it? I'm, oh, I'm not sure, but you know, I'm gonna, I'll stick with it, and then pretty much on the hour, it clicks in, and it just goes absolutely fucking mental, and for the next hour. It was the heaviest and most intense music musical experience of my life. <laughs> he had like these young, no, these small men like Gurners, you know, like the, whose lips can like come up over their face. It's like I don't know, very English thing of like they were like up on the stage dancing with like just like f- <laughs> literally distorted faces, just because like they've got really big faces. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> so weird. And then just an unbelievable laser and light show and this fucking mad, you know, techno breakbeat acid house shit. And for an hour, and like when it finished, I was just like, well, that's that's the best music I've ever heard. (laughs) It was unreal. So yeah, Aphex Twin, that's... I mean, he's he, good. He, 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 <laughs> he, he, he loves playing on the anonymity thing. I mean, he has so many aliases. I made a list of some of the aliases. And so far, we have AFX, obviously, that we're talking about just now. You've got Blue Calcs, Bradley Strider, The Universal Indicator, Caustic Window, Smudgy Face, Gak, Martin Treseder, Phonic Boy on Dope, or PBOD, uh, Polygon Window, Q Chastic, Dice Man, uh, Soet PP, 
And then you've got the Tuss, including Karen Tregeskin and Brian Tregeskin, which is a, an act that they still don't actually know if it was a fixed twin. But if you go on the BMI register for like royalties, it's registered as James Richard David. <laughs> Uh, so they assume uh, it probably is And it does sound like them It's got a Yamaha uh, GX1 I think is it a GX1? Yeah I think it's a GX1 uh, Which is a really rare instrument that, that he has That people know he has So it's it's likely it was him But he, he says there's no big theory to that He says that he just basically calls it Whatever it feels like at any given time It's not like some master plan of different personas um, But he has observed that he also gets falsely uh, accredited with any number of anonymous electronic acts that, that ring stuff out in any given year. People just assume, you know, like jump to conclusions right, left and centre. So there's loads of stuff out there that also gets attributed to him that yeah. he, he genuinely says he has nothing to do with. Well, so Aphex Twin, he kind of went off the radar a little bit. After Drugs. After Drugs, but officially officially as Aphex Twin, he didn't release another record till Cyro in 2014 but he was always doing stuff like the Tuss and this Analord series and stuff like that yeah once Cyro came out and then he's been releasing a couple of VPs as well but one ridiculous thing that he did was this SoundCloud drop as it's called data dump where basically uh, I, I remember sitting in my old work at Creative Scotland sitting in the office and kind of seeing it all unfold and it was like so weirdly done you know like Aphex Twin's official SoundCloud account had like commented on something and somebody followed it to this anonymous user, 1703894444, whatever. Yeah, he did a lot of that, users with, with code numbers, but they were yeah. like, they related to his birth date and stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. And to begin with, and it was, you had to follow this chain of conversation to find this person. And then this person was started releasing tracks and people were like, fuck that's really good or you know that sounds like old Aphex Twin or whatever and then basically over a few weeks it turned out that he'd been re- was releasing hundreds of tracks you know from early 90s and these were all like demos and reworks and live tracks and stuff like that and I think it ended up with like over 250 tracks yeah that's right but they deleted it at one point and then put it back and up. then put it yeah, back yeah. up yeah. Well, um, and it changed still deleted yeah. I looked at it and I couldn't find it and it was I just remember following that and going into a message room like the I can't remember what message board it was but it like followed it exactly and was telling you, you know when there was updates and there was just a huge excitement around the world of all these Aphex Twin and dance music fans were just like fucking hell this is like this is genuinely feels like christmas it's unreal but also at the same time there was lots of like people coming out with anonymous usernames releasing music that was also quite good and people were attributing it to it and then it turned out that it wasn't him (laughs) but it was like a weird way to judge music because you were trying to judge it and going this is quite good do I think it's good because I think it's Aphex Twin or do I think it's good because it's not Aphex Twin? And it was like a really weird you, way you know of cognitive that, like that's experiment. Brilliant. That's a brilliant way to raise that point as well, man, because one of the problems I have regarding the later part of Aphex Twin's career is I don't think it's particularly good. Um, I don't think he's done a lot of great merit since... This, this stuff's pretty good, but certainly since like 2001... I'm not even a huge fan of drugs. I think it's it's pretty decent. But a lot of the stuff that's come out subsequently, I mean, even Cyro was stuff that was recorded at the same time or written at the same time as the earlier sessions. you're really like plumbing your back catalogue for things like that and I don't think he's said much else that's particularly new or particularly interesting since then but yet Cyro won a Grammy and none of these other previous records did and there's an element of Aphex Twin has acquired such a cult status so much like he's, he's one of those few people we've spoken about it before that are unimpeachable like you can't 
properly criticise them without incurring the massive wrath. The fact that there's even a documentary on Radio 4 about the obsessives that have AFX twin tattoos all over them and are just like, everything he's done is absolutely magnificent. There is a point where your objectivity is sacrificed because you're so invested in one, a- one act. And when I listen to there's like there's a there's a guy called Tipper who is at times like AFX twin, far, far less hip. But you could do a taste test with some of the material and have people fail at, you know, a Pepsi challenge on that. And that's the thing that bothers me a little bit about AFX Twin. It, and especially when we were researching this, was trying to challenge myself to be objective. How good is this actually? Like, do I like this because I am a kind of person that thinks I'm I am an AFX Twin type person? I'm edgy, I'm unconventional, you know, I like Chris Morris, you know, it's like, Mm. Am I liking it because it's that and I know it's AFX Twin? Or am I liking it because it's particularly good? And I think, to be honest, I think a lot of AFX Twin stuff is quite overrated. I think he has so much out there that it's that's fair enough. By, by his own account, he says he started <laughs> making music when he was 10. Supposedly got a ZX Spectrum and started coding for it in a way where the TV signal started causing all these weird hums and... Uh, yeah, he basically made noise out of it yeah, without made, a sound processor. Exactly, yeah. And then by the time he was 13, he had like 100 hours of ambient tracks that as a kid he was just making things that he didn't know what he was making. And this, he got to the point where he was writing algorithms and the algorithms were just writing the music and he was then working around that. So the algorithms would dictate the rhythm and the melody and he's then doctoring and tweaking that and working over the top of it. But as a result, that algorithm made a different track every time. So he just had hundreds and hundreds of hours of this music. And so even just to listen back through all of that in, its, in and of itself is a huge challenge. To data dump like 200, 250 tracks that on top of an Analord series that ended up ballooning to 62 tracks because it was originally 42 and then they added 20 more. It's just, I mean, there's so much material there and I honestly don't think all of it is of a, of, of a high standard. But the stuff that is is phenomenally good like really fucking good like genius level good it's just exhausting to try and objectively wade wade through it and really say how 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 good is this yeah no it is but i think it's a it's a challenge and there's absolutely like i'm a big apex twin fan well he's he's the most it was the the phrase which is the most influential figure in electronic music yeah Uh, and he probably is but i agree in that i think there's a lot of shit in there or they're not shit but you know there's a lot of stuff that isn't amazing but that's because there's such an incredible amount of music out there anybody that's prolific is kind of prone to that yeah exactly you know it's just his way of working and he puts a huge amount out there i don't think it dilutes the quality of the stuff that is is really really good i think it's it's a world that you can get lost in uh which i i think is part of his intrigue and his appealing sort of myth is the fact that you, there's so much out there that you you know of the, there's you know five six hundred tracks out there that and you can go and find one and it feels like it's your own one and nobody else knows about it i think that's that's really appealing for a lot of fans like his who are quite obsessive or just really really into f- music <laughs> Hey peeps, uh, sorry to interrupt your listening experience uh, and I've not run this by the guys yet but I'm going to wing it and take things in my own direction. I'm going to say this week, don't send us any money. Don't send us any money. But, please, what would be really nice is if we can start to expand our listenership. So can you share the episode or recommend the episode? Or, or an episode. An episode that you think people will like. Just try and tag someone in, turn someone on to the podcast in some way, because if all the people that are listening just now get one other person to listen, that doubles our listenership. Uh, and also, a review would be great, even if it's a one-word review, like some of the weird shit we've been getting. <laughs> <laughs> Chibberish. Chibberish. Uh, thanks. Um, but yeah, forget the money. Put your wallet back in your pocket. I know you were ready by the phone. Just share it, tag it. Thanks. Here you go. Back to the show.
I mean, he seems like you see, he obviously comes across like a very self-aware guy. I mean, he made a, he, he made a, a comment about himself uh, where he said, "I'm some irritating, lying ginger kid from Cornwall," uh, and then he went on, "I just managed to escape and blag it in music." Yeah, you know, exactly. He's he's there's there's a definitely a humility and a sense of absurdity even from his own perspective, and he, he admits as well that he frequently lies. He trolls the media. Th- constantly mm-hmm. with, with, with false stories like fake releases all kinds of like stupid shit like that and so sometimes when you're reading these little stories about the anecdotes about what he was doing when he was younger it's like how true is that you know, he's got claims about synesthesia where he's writing music during lucid dreams he claims that he uses sleep deprivation to write I, I would suggest that means he's probably sleeping better these days <laughs> <laughs> um and you know all the stuff about the algorithms and 13 and having hundreds of hours of or 100 hours of um ambient music i don't always know what what to really take it face value if it's doing but i don't think of of all people i think he would be bemused by the the plaudits that syro received given that syro other than um mini pops which is a really strong track that's the plaudits it received the grammy it received when you look at the quality of stuff that went before it and also the quality of other electronica that came out that year think he would be a little bit like that's pure sycophancy that i've got that, that that's yeah my, possibly that's I, th- I think his the awards that came out for that record it was like mainstream were going oh fuck we maybe abandoned aphex twin in 2001 because you know we critically fucking mauled that record and then he just fucked off basically and then he turns up 13 years later going hey i'm still pretty good and they've all gone oh fuck we better show face and you know make you know, give him that cultural legitimacy that you know that we f- we didn't give him before. Um, but I do. I still think that record's really, really good. I I don't think it's really good. I mean, I think the problem is as well. He turned up thirteen years later, saying, "Hey, I was still good fifteen years ago," because he he released music that that predated his departure from mm-hmm. the spotlight. So I don't see the relevance of him coming back and releasing the older material. As though it somehow proved his detractors no, wrong. No, I don't know. There's so, I like the production on that record. There's a lot of really, really good bits on that on that album. I uh, I was cynical about that record when I when it came because I was very aware of the sort of hype that was building up to it, and it was like, f- you know, he could release a total shiter here. People are expect. Also, people were thinking about him he's going to come and rewrite the rule book Hmm. but i think what he did was he released just a really good aphex twin album it sounds like aphex twin it doesn't sound like a new step forward in dance music it doesn't sound like you know he's revolutionized anything but what he's done is he's really pinpointed his sound um it just sort of seems like he released a collection of music from his peak period to to sort of re emphasize this is what Aphex Twin sounds like. I just find that a bit disappointing because one of the things that Aphex Twin sounded like was constantly different. So when you go from like eight, the 85 to 92 selected ambient works, which for a lot of people is still their favourite Aphex Twin record. Uh, to me, I think that's his best record. So it's, it's, it's I think a, that's his defining a, record. And I, you know, I think it's a work of absolute genius, but it's, I, it's, it's, a, it's in no way underrated. <laughs> no, no, not at all. <laughs> What I mean is, though, it's got, it's got sensational stuff in it, absolutely. And But it's got a sound that then changed for Selected Ambient Works Volume 2 mm-hmm. and became almost entirely ambient. But then changed again for... Um, uh, I was it uh, I care because you do um, where the, the drums and the break beats started to come in mm-hmm. 
yeah. and then changed again for the Richard D. James album, which for me is his best work. Um, and that that's the point there was no Aphex Twins and then you know you had Come to Daddy you had Window Liquor yep, but, but, also, and, well, but also you had earlier stuff like Didgeridoo you had this really intense acidy techno stuff you had stuff like um, uh, Analog Bugble Bath the Polygon Window stuff exactly Caustic Window you had, that, um, you had Donkey Rhubarb <laughs> So you've got a guy whose sound is no one sound, and yet he came back and sort of seemed to say, "All right, no, that was my sound." Yeah, it's, I know. It's but interesting what he said about the record as well. Like the album's overall sound is as pop as pop record or as poppy as he's going to get. Yeah, pleasurable to listen to. Maybe just the compositions have changed, but there's no next level beats on now. I don't think these tracks are particularly innovative. Maybe in really subtle ways they are for me. But there is nothing there that I need to explore anymore. It just totally makes me want to not do anything else in that particular style. Yeah, so for me, he's he was forty two when that record came out. He hasn't had anything out in the mainstream really for th- you know, thirteen years. He's just been tucked away in his studio producing shit and making shit. And I think at one point he's just gone, Oh, I feel like this maybe sounds like a finished record and he's sent it to warp. And they've gone, fuck it, let's just do an FX Twin record. You can't expect necessarily a 42-year-old to be as innovative as he was in the 90s when he was, you know, basically a genius. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of I kind of have a slightly different take on it. I kind of feel like maybe he wanted to close a chapter. So he wanted to release this stuff that had been lingering about and just get it over and done with. Well, that's what he says. So yeah, that's pretty an much an what he's but done. An end of an but, and it's him. a good record. But perhaps with a view to moving on to do something again that was a little bit more... Uh, inspiring and groundbreaking because I mean, well, when you look, I think that's I think probably in the next couple of years we'll hear possibly, a lot yeah. of stuff. I mean, I think if you look at like the stuff like Didgeridoo, I mean, that foreshadowed drum and bass to some extent. <laughs> Yeah. And, we, and you look at the, the crossover appeal of like things like Come to Daddy, the fact that Dillinger Escape Plan recorded that incredible cover version of it. Like that was stuff that, and, and obviously, obviously Window Liquor, which Window Liquor didn't just move the goalposts in terms of the the music it moved the goalposts in terms of the whole aesthetic of mm-hmm. dance music and electronic music and the fact that it was deeply disturbing like the fact that it was challenging and it's consistent as well with his and it, it, his subsequent involvement with chris morris and the the jam and blue jam series that really really dark satire that he did with chris morris where he was doing the the sound for it in the end uh Rodney the what got drowned. He went under and never came up again. Turned out uh, Bob tied his face to the bottom with a newt. I mean that's like that is consistent with the window liquor sort of approach of the guy. And the fact that he then wasn't really pushing himself or really challenging people in that way was just I don't know, it just it just became a little bit stale. So I mean Going on to the, to the one you chose, though, the Analog series, I think it's interesting that having done so much stuff on digital formats, he then was like, I'm going to primarily do these 11 releases um, or this huge catalogue of stuff using mostly analog equ- equipment. That at least is like a, an element of somebody who's got to a point in their career where they're like, I want to challenge yeah. myself. I want to kind of set a bunch of uh, criteria that forced me to work within certain parameters and maybe I'll produce something different. And he did. And it's 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 really good stuff. There's a there's a lot more of a, a crowdy feel to a lot of it as well because it's coming through um, analogue equipment. It, it was 
pretty interesting hearing people's different uh, theories on the name, by the way, because Annalord is also an anagram of a Roland, and <laughs> not and he uses a an absolute slew of Roland yeah, machines. A He's got a TR six hundred six, an eight hundred eight, and nine hundred nine. There's loads of other Roland equipment used in it. Yeah, um, and <laughs> so I can't remember who it was. Somebody also mused on the fact that he probably hadn't overlooked the fact that it's anal lord. <laughs> I think he'll just be tickled by a little wordplay because he's yeah he's a silly man. But you know, absolutely. I like the fact as well on it that, and I'm I can't work out if he did it deliberately because I I think for volumes eight, nine, and eleven, so it started at ten, then it did like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven. Yeah. Um. But for eight, nine, and eleven, he started naming the tracks after viruses and malware, and. I don't know whether it's just because viruses and malware are kind of sinister and cool and very modern and sort of it's an interesting concept, but a lot of people have suggested that it was to stop file sharing as well hmm. because so many of the things <laughs> that you look... It was got, certainly like that peak time. Yeah, uh, absolutely. You know, where you're downloading tracks and torrenting tracks, you know, and that's and what, stuff that's, like that. That's a really interesting angle on it. That, yeah. that, that could have been a, a motivation for the names of them. But yeah, I mean, like, like I said as well, it, it is ultimately a compilation, albeit I do think it, it listens very consistently throughout. The first one of those series was in 2004 and this came out in 2006. Then he's, he's had time to assemble that run order, but yeah, I, I, I do agree. It's, it's, it's a consistent listen. It, it, it makes a lot of sense. What did you think, Mark? Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think of Apex Twin I'd overall? I've never heard the Apex Twin before, apart from Come to Daddy and Winter Lurker, because everybody's kind of heard those songs, and yeah. I, I actually can't tell you what Winter Lurker sounds like. I can't hear it in my head. Um, it kind of goes. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like sleaze. <laughs> it's fucking great. Uh, but this was hard to listen to for me, but I actually enjoyed that. Mm -hmm. I don't listen to this kind of stuff. I was just went in with completely like zero expectations. Yeah. Like, no preconceived notions of what Apex Twin sounds like. Apex Twin, sorry. <laughs> He's still saying Apex Twin. <laughs> See, fuck <laughs> me, man. If, what, if, fucking chain of hotels. What it sounds like, <laughs> but that is the Apex Hotel, isn't it? Um, but yeah, it was interesting. I feel like there's like a lot more difficult records that we could have oh, put you up to, but yeah, also easier as so. well. Yeah, it's also but the thing that the thing that kind of broke the whole that whole spell for me was the fact that it's just so engaging. Yeah, it's just so immersive and engaging. Like I just wanted to see what was going to happen next because everything's always evolving, no matter in all the songs. I think know? that's what maybe like a lot of the times in that Pepsi challenge with FX Twin is there's just something in his production. Nothing's ever like standard. It never goes from one bit to the other. It just completely flows, and there's always you know well, I'll, in I'll, and out. See, see, in, on this um, on this record, I think there's a lot of mistakes. But I think he's left them there. Yeah, I think there's like, because he's doing stuff well, with, with a, analog me equipment. There's there's room for like a you know a bad filter move. There's there's a lot of stuff that can happen mm -hmm. within that. And it sounds like at some points the take has been flawed, but he's liked the flaw a bit like you know a bit like a guitarist or a, mm -hmm. you know getting like a bit of feedback or, or pinching a note. At the well, yeah, place I mean the the actual the track that got me into this record was track two, Reunion. Mm -hmm. And I think on that, it's ju it just sounds like the timing is slightly off. It's kind of seasick, that track. Yeah. yeah. It's got a weird... And I don't know if that's feel. deliberate or not. You know, that, that track really reminds me of Beak. You know, the, the, the project yeah, yeah, by yeah. Uh, Jeff Barrow from Portishead. Except yeah. it's obviously, it's got a breakbeat over it and Beak mm -hmm. never get that fast. got that seasick analog quality and slightly out that just it, makes you it feel sort of bit, weaves in and out yeah. but then it's got that just kick drum just going like that yeah. all the way through there's actually there's kick's like, got a huge sub on it as well man yeah. when i was listening to it this morning in, in, in my flat you could, I could actually it's the only song in the whole record which has got that massive sub boom on the kick drum yeah there's um, fucking feel it man. there's actually there's an act from bristol just now called vessel not plural just vessel yeah um who has uh, a track called red six and i think it takes a lot from that seasick uneasy sense uh, of uh, a slight malevolence that goes through some electronic music.
Yeah, you know, I, th- a bit I had, I had, you know, it sounds menacing. Yeah, it's. Uh, but then by the end of it, it's dancey and it's. Yeah, you know, absolutely. It's I mean, I think the first track, uh, Phoenix Funk, which I, I believe I'm guessing took its name for a thing called a synth in Phoenix, which is like a modular unit that he uses, mm-hmm. um, or Phoenix Funk Five. Sorry, that starts reasonably well. It's got a really class bit that comes in it too, and that's one of those moments where you see a potentially average bit of music being elevated by somebody's sensibilities. So yeah, yeah I do agree in those situations. When it slows down, Almost like it starts cut that like it starts to cutting in something else at like one minute twenty and it just slowly kind of yeah goes in there like a really yeah I it's just got it's a really like, nice yeah. high synth part yeah, that comes totally. in it's really good I do think though on this there's like uh, a song called uh, Pit Card number yeah. three doesn't really do it for me it's it's dead squelchy it's a bit kind of acidy but I, I, I don't know, I think, it's, I think there's got... It does feel a little bit dated, it remains, but... It's got a very Vangelis synth sound underneath it. Yeah, uh, it has got a nice pad in it, actually. Yeah, I noticed that. That's that's one of the ones that does have a really cool But tone. do you know what it reminded... It reminded me of, like, at that same time, uh, like, Chemical Brothers were doing stuff, like, Star Guitar or whatever, that, to me... You know, Chemical Brothers in the late 90s were f- fucking incredible, you know, innovators, but... By the time it got to like 2004, 2005, they were doing a lot of middle of the road sounding stuff. And, you know, their synths didn't sound too great and it was a bit yeah. squelchy. Yeah. And this reminds me of that, but there's got, it's just got so much more going on. It's, I think it is, it's dated to that sort of mid 2000s synthy noise, even though it's analog, but there's still an elevation of it, you know, because there's, the composition is so. It was one. Of, it was one of the ones that kind of passed me by a wee bit. Although in seeing that the, the one after it, "Crying in Your Face," I think's one of the best songs on it. I think yeah. it's a really, really good chord progression. It's it's much more conventional uh, arrangement for it's a, a song. A lot of space in it as well. Uh, it's, it's really crowdy, and I love the vocoder sample thing that he's got mm-hmm. throughout it. It's, it's actually one of the most accessible tunes on it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's a track uh, called Silonin as well, it's track eight, yeah. um, which basically starts almost exactly like a John Carpenter tune. I think it's one of the best, it's got a really kind of frantic melody, it's quite a, it's got a bit of the Marnie Stern <laughs> in terms yeah. of just the frantic, you know, pointillism mm-hmm. of the notes. so well towards the end yeah as well. it's got a really nice high line mm-hmm. and stuff as the drums come back as well at the end um boxing day was good boxing day track six uh, talking about little glitches and flaws that he left and has a moment of feedback at 340 yeah it just goes Meep. yeah you actually hear yeah, yeah. the analog thing feedback i don't know how that's happened but he's just again just left it in <laughs> So, I mean, there definitely are really, really good bits of music on this. I think the rest of it was fine. I didn't think it was really standout, um, but... I don't know, I like, like I think, PW Steel LD Pinch. <laughs> that, that <laughs> catchy number. I, I, uh, but it is a, that's a really catchy track. I, I'd it's, written down that it was a soft banger. Because it's weird. It's like a yeah. It's it's a bit of a banger, but it's for the floor. Yeah, but you know, it's not too. It doesn't. It's not too hard. Funnily really. enough, that uh, drum loop that he's using is used in a couple of other tracks. Um, I mean, I I th- I ended up going like down an internet hole a few years ago because I was just like, that's exactly the same drum sample as 
I think it's It Doesn't Matter by Chemical Brothers off uh, their second album. So and it's, it's like the Wilhelm scream of drums. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and it's also uh, on a track by FC Kahuna as well. Um, just that. Uh, but like it it really fucking works here. Um, and it's like a sort of, yeah, it's a, it's a soft, euphoric club banger. I enjoy club job quite a lot. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's dead engaging, and then there's a really creepy it's melody. It's like three down. minutes thirty, which is yeah. just like the instrumentation really there is really interesting, yeah. isn't mm-hmm. it? Um, see, I mean, Mark, for people such as yourself that aren't familiar with FX Twin, mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of like stuff that you should investigate. I think you should investigate the really early stuff. There's there's like a classics sort of compilation thing that's got stuff like Didgeridoo on it. And Didgeridoo does seem pretty dated, but it's fucking class. It's really great bit of music. There's stuff like um, Four from the Richard D. James album. The opening track is a total beast. Uh, there's also a track called Alber- Alberto Balsam. Oh, I love Alberto well, Balsam. Yeah, that's, a, that's like, I think for people who are a fan of him, it's even mentioned in that documentary how much they love that bit of music and that's uh, from I Care Because You Do. Uh, there's also a track just called uh, just called Rhubarb which is on um, the Selected Ambient Works Volume 2 which by the way Wes Borland from Limp Biscuit said if he had to listen to one track for yeah, the rest of I his life, he'd probably he'd listen to that or the first track off that album called Cliffs. <laughs> so high praise indeed coming from Wes Borland. We weren't able to find out what Fred Durst was listening to, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but Fine, um, blue eyes, by the way. Yeah, there's, there's, I mean, yeah, the mythology of the guy is incredible. The back catalogue is comprehensive and huge, and there, there are highs and lows, but the highs are very, very high indeed. In fact, the highs have probably shaped the entire genre more than as much as anybody else, certainly. There's some, there's some really kind of fun details about him, right, because he's got a lot of fans, and he's a big fan of people like Steve Reich and stuff like that, and um, Philip Glass. He's got a Philip Glass track as the the B side to um, Donkey Rhubarb. Donkey Rhubarb. Um, and it's it's kind of strange to be honest. Uh, he Steve Reich's a big fan of his, and so is to, uh, but so is Tom York. Tom York said it's his favorite, sorry, his favorite that. artist ever. And Radiohead asked him to tour with them, <laughs> and he said, "I wouldn't tour with them since I don't like them." Yeah, exactly. He doesn't but give he, a fuck. But he's done a comp- he's done a collaborative album with Johnny Greenwood, so there's obviously no hard feelings. Yeah, but he's also got a compilation record of his remixes called Twenty Six Mixes for Cash for Cash, which is brilliant. Like like a really you know self referential. Like, yeah, exactly. I think class. that's uh, I think that's time we're going into the Foo Fighters next, this guys. All right, okay. Well, I'm happy to I'll do play that a bit right of music. now. Yeah, yeah I'll play a bit yeah. of music. Love it. Yeah. You're a pr- production master as well, Chris. Thanks, man. Thanks. See you guys everywhere. Uh, okay, right. I think we've all got one. Yeah. Oh, I so don't let's have see. One. Oh, do you not have no, one? You guys are you you. First Okay. Day. Okay. So, uh, Richard D. James, he created the Reflex Records record label. Yep, with Grant Wilson Claridge. Yeah. And, uh, Which is also, by the way, the era when probably had his best tunes. And, um, one of the uh, the key artists on Reflex was uh, Square Pusher, another 
um, musical innovator, Tom mm. Jenkinson. Uh, Tom Jenkinson in 2018 provided the ambient soundtrack for CBB's hour long wind down program, Daydreams, <laughs> uh, which was narrated by Josh, Josh Holm. Holm. No, <laughs> it was narrated by Olivia Coleman. Olivia okay. Coleman, who has been in program. Peep Show. Uh, oh no! Um, Broadchurch, Broadchurch, Iron Lady, um, stuff like that, and she was in Hot Fuzz in two thousand and seven. Uh, I think you've went past six jumps. Here, like, no, like, no, he's not. This is brilliant. Let Hot go. Fuzz go. Uh, also included a cameo from a Mister Steve Coogan. <laughs> Steve Coogan. I'm not sure if you have heard. Uh, made Sweet Love to Courtney Love one time. Wow. And, and Courtney Love, back around. I'm pretty sure it's connected to Dave Grohl somehow. Yeah. I mean, nice. that's a lot of jumps, but they are fantastic. In Thanks fact, I, I'll be honest, I like the idea of the Foo Fighters Nexus being how elaborate can you get well, within the Well, why six? don't we, we should do a short one and then a long one? Yep. My ones are always going to be short. This one's quite easy. Yeah. Um, on 26 Mixies for Cash, Richard D. James was not a fan of the band Nine Inch Nails, but he did contribute two remixes to Follow Down the Spiral, which weren't actually remixes, but were two completely separate bands. Exactly, this is exactly what I was going to say as well, yeah. And, uh, yeah, Dave Rhodes played drums for Nine Inch Nails, so there you go. Was he not a fan of Nine Inch Nails? No. <laughs> I didn't pick that up at all. I didn't even hear the original songs, I just, I just gave him two songs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, Thrill Marks, that's brilliant. Interesting. So we obviously do this podcast from Glasgow, and I only found out today that uh, Richard D. James lives in Scotland from uh, uh, since well, 2014. He might. he might. Well, uh, he, he said it in an interview to Rolling Stone, I think, or somebody. I said it in a few now, and he's he's. Spoken, but I mean, he also said that he Glowland. lived in an old bank vault, which might be true. He said he, that he owns had a tank. an old bank. He, he uh, does own an old bank. Yeah, that's see a lot of these myths are actually true because like he says that he drives a tank, but he, he has, doesn't drive a tank. No, he owns a <laughs> ex military vehicle. Yeah. As as does Ross Noble. It's just like but it's not it's actually classified do. as yeah, you just get a fucking get an old military Pick vehicle for the power. No bother. <laughs> you can, you get them in military surplus store. I would hundred <laughs> percent have a ex military one of this podcast, we would be coming <laughs> in a yeah. In a, so, but he has vehicle. said that he moved his family north and lives in a village near Glasgow. Yeah, within like within an hour of Glasgow. The, the chat is that it's an airshow, but I know it's. I mean, you might be pissed off there. if we start broadcasting this. But you know, I don't know. But um, we don't have his address. Yeah, there was also I heard. Um, I think that that is that is that's the rumor anyway. That's that's what the kids are saying. Um, I also heard a great rumor from a sort of friend of the pod, who knows. And has spent some time with these either his tour manager, or his ex tour manager, and yeah, the the story goes that uh, he at some point had been involved in a, a house deal to buy a property in Perth, yeah, which uh, then went uh, un- t- uh, unoccupied or li- he forgot that he, he forgot owned that he owned it, and he went up to see the property, and the property had squatters in it, and he went in and struck a deal up with them, which was like you know well, just pay me some rent, you then. need to pay me some rent if you want to stay here, and apparently when he was leaving, they said. Are you a fixed twin? And he's like, No, you've got the wrong guy. Oh, it's not me. Who are you talking about? <laughs> you talking about? <laughs> I also remember because he moved up to Scotland in the last sort of four or five years. In 2014, apparently. And he uh, speaks in glowing terms of the country. So there you go, tourist board. I, Why are you wasting your time? <laughs> I remember. Uh, Wait, hang on. I don't think that's true. Hearing. I read that the Sido was recorded in his, mostly recorded in his studio in 2006, which is in Scotland. Well, mm. who knows? This is it. 20, who knows? 2014. But I also date. heard that. Uh, the Say Award, the Scottish Album of the Year Award, uh, didn't accept this as an a submission, even though it's an album created in Scotland. Because frankly, that would just wouldn't be fair. So you know, there you are. Yeah. So this um, record, then, why why this record or not? For me, I think this album is perfect sort of summation of his talents. It came after all the sort of nineties hype had died down. Wasn't released to a huge fanfare, and it just stood there as an uh, as a collection of his work without. The mythology without the hype, I don't think it's his defining work. 
I think there are a couple of albums that are much more perfect. Yeah, but this but is I think unsung. Yeah. This is the unsung record in Aphex's or Richard D. James's discography because I think as an album, it's a really, really excellent record that sounds like it belongs together. It's really interesting and nobody ever talks about it. I think you make a really compelling case and I think you're right, not enough people talk about it. Um, especially not as a, an entry point if you want to explore the Anna Lord series because exploring those 11 records is pretty daunting in and of itself. I don't fall out with it. I wouldn't throw my weight behind it, so I'm very much on the fence. But that's not a criticism of the record in itself. It's just because this guy is such a high a high. Oh, that's standard. it. I mean, we could do an album from each of his synonyms yeah. or whatever. So so I'm, I'm going to... I'm gonna, but this take, is the one take, that has... Take the fifth on yeah. this one. I'm going, to, I'm going to abstain like Chris. I enjoy this record a lot, but there's a lot to get through. Great. So it's all all down to me. It's public makes its call. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. Let's go hope, for it. But I should I should go down and saying that I think we all think this record's quite good. So oh, it's this this definitely worth listening to. Definitely worth listening to. And I mean, do you know what the last track we didn't talk about the last track, but for me it's the best track. XMD five. Yeah. A? I think by the end of it, it sounds like a big fucking post rock. Oh riff. yeah, the end, yeah. The end of it is staggering, man. Yeah. So good. Yeah. yeah. The big dark ending and that is a beast. So yeah, great record. What we should do one of these next week as well. I think so. An already, f- an already fixed one one. <laughs> <laughs> can we not? Uh, on can, we not can we not find an artist with a slightly bigger back catalogue so I can have even less of personal time? Uh, on the next episode, we're doing Pink by Boris. I'm very happy with that. <clears throat> yep, not messing about there, are you? No. If I can then even run that by us. <laughs> Fuck we've it. We've already spoken about this. <laughs> uh, okay, thanks a lot. Uh, go vote on Facebook for if you think Chosen Lord should make it into discography. And that would be very, very nice of you. And some reviews, please. Tell your friends. Should we tell them that we're going to be doing a club night next week? <laughs> oh, yeah, we're going to DJ. But, a uh, week today. Yeah, I think it... Um, well, well, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, so yeah, August, August the 3rd. August the 3rd. I'm afraid I won't be there. In it's going to be you two. Yeah, we are going to play... White man music. Yeah, it's going to be... Apex Twin all night. Better or worse. For the <laughs> we're, good, we're basically challenged ourselves to play the best... Tunes that aren't the obvious tunes by artists mm-hmm. or great tunes by acts that are unsung. So to try and stick with the theme of the pod, so you know, we'll let you Mark's pretty much just gonna play Prince yeah. all night. So. Basically, yeah. <laughs> so I'm gonna have to try and add in the variety. So, you know, uh, I'll I'll do my best. Okay. Great. Thank you very much, gents. See Cheers. you there. Thanks. Bye.